Today's lecture is on the peopling of Indonesia and Australia. New information in just the past 16 years is changing our picture of the settling of the Indonesian and Philippine Islands, which are on the route to Australia. These areas were settled during the Pleistocene, or the Ice Age, when glaciation caused low sea levels, allowing some land masses to be joined. A new species, Homo floresiensis, was found in a cave entrance on the island of Flores in Indonesia. These hominins used the cave between 100,000 and 60,000 years ago. Now the Indo-Malaysian archipelago contains two very different biogeographical regions. The Western Islands on the Sunda shelf, that is Sumatra, Java, Bali, and Borneo, were joined to each other and to the Asian mainland by land bridges during glacial periods of low sea level. And on this map, the light colored areas indicate that land that was exposed during glaciation. Hence, the Western Islands supported a rich Asian placental mammal fauna and were colonized by Homo erectus, perhaps as early as 1.8 million years ago. The Eastern Islands, Sulawesi, Lombok, Timor, the Moluccas, and the Philippines have never been linked by land bridges to either the Sunda Shelf or the Sahal Shelf, that is Australia, New Guinea, or to each other. They had limited mammal faunas through chance arrivals from Asia and Australasia. Homo floresiensis, nicknamed hobbits, was first found in 2004 on the island of Flores in Indonesia. These creatures are slightly over three foot in height and have a brain one third the size of ours. So on the bottom left, you can see a so-called hobbit skull and on the right, compared to a modern day Homo sapiens. These were recovered from deep deposits within the limestone cave entrance. So far, they've recovered bones from at least 14 individuals, and they were finding some primitive features that are very puzzling. For example, although the big toe is aligned like ours, it is short, and the other toes are long and curved, and the foot lacks an arch. All of these last characteristics are very ape-like. Also, the foot appears to be unusually long, hence the nickname hobbits, or at least it appears long because the lower leg is so short. So they have short legs, long feet. In fact, below the head, they look more like Australopithecus, that is Lucy, than Homo. But even though the brain is grapefruit sized, the head looks like Homo. And here is a John Gourchet reconstruction um, on one of the skulls of the face. When did the hobbits live there? Well, from the initial discovery in 2004 up until 2016, they were thought to have remained on the island until as recently as 18,000 years ago, which raised all sorts of questions since Homo sapiens was widespread by then and present on the island by 11,000 years ago. But a new round of dating with new stratigraphic analysis and new dating techniques in 2016 showed that Homo floresiensis used the cave between 100,000 to 60,000 years ago. They were found associated with stone tools, and the stone toolkit is very basic, similar to a Homo habilis toolkit, or an Oldowan technique. Here you see an excavator uncovering a bone. And stone tools from multiple sites on the island date from 190,000 to 50,000 years ago. At the cave on Flores, we find also Komodo dragon and rat bones. When first found, Homo floresiensis was very controversial. Was it a Homo sapiens with some sort of condition such as microcephaly or cretinism or Laron syndrome? However, now it is recognized as a new species, Homo floresiensis. Finds elsewhere on the island indicate that Homo erectus reached the island by about 700,000 years ago, or during the Middle Pleistocene. 
These evolved into a small size as a response to the limited resources on an island, what's called insular dwarfism, something we'd seen in other mammals, but never before in humans. So the evolution of the new species must have occurred in less than about 300,000 years, leading some researchers to create a computer model to see whether that was possible. The research team ran almost 10,000 computer model simulations using random combinations of various parameters, including climate change, sea level change. For the bulk of the simulations, it took fewer than 500 generations for a full-size Homo erectus species to evolve into the smaller Homo floresiensis species. And the most frequent outcome in more than 600 model runs was around 280 generations or just over 4,000 years. So yes, 300,000 years is enough time for a new species to evolve on an island. Pygmy people still live on the island today. And of course, that leads us to ask, are the hobbits their ancestors? In 2013, a reef research trip went and asked for permission from these people to look at their DNA, and they were eager to find out whether they were related to the ancient hobbits. Their average height is 4.5 feet tall, so they are taller than the ancient hobbits. Now we've been unable to recover DNA from the hobbits themselves. Nevertheless, they could compare the modern pygmy people's DNA to other modern people's DNA and see if there's any unexplained DNA that could be from hobbits. So the 2018, we found out that the DNA of the modern pygmies shows that they were not related to Homo floresiensis, but they do carry DNA from Neanderthals and Denisovans. Homo floresiensis hunted Komodo dragons, pygmy elephants, and other games and fish. To conclude, I post here two videos, the first about Homo floresiensis, and this was prior to the redating, so you'll find the wrong dates given in that first video, and a video on insular dwarfism, and I recommend that you come back and watch these. Now, a new species was named just last year in the Philippines, Homo luzonensis. It was found in Kalawa Cave on the north end of uh, one of the islands in um, the Philippines, dating between 50 to 60,000 years ago. This island was never connected to mainland Asia during the Quaternary, so it would have required crossing a little bit of water to get there. This new species is based on just a few skeletal elements representing three individuals from Kalawa Cave in the northern Luzon Island in the Philippines. Now this picture is a little bit misleading because it shows different views of the same bones. So there's just one femur on the right showing three different views and then uh, two toe bones and two finger bones but showing three different views of each. So uh, not as many bones as it appears from this photo. Stone tools and a butchered rhinoceros in the nearby Cagayan Valley indicates that hominins, perhaps Homo luzonensis, have been present on Luzon since more than 700,000 years ago. And the bones show a mosaic of characteristics of many different hominins, such as Homo neanderthalensis, Homo floresiensis, and Homo sapiens, but also primitive morphological features that are typically found in earlier hominins, including Australopithecus and Paranthropus. How this new species fits in and how it is related to other species has yet to be determined because we have so few bones. But clearly, both Homo luzonensis and Homo floresiensis were present east of the Wallace line on Luzon and Flores, respectively, at the same time and perhaps even over a similar temporal interval. The skeletons of both species present anatomical traits that are either rare or absent elsewhere in the genus Homo, but have similarities with those of Australopithecus. And as, in the, 
as is in the case with the island of Flores, a substantial sea crossing has always been required to reach Luzon from any mainland, even during the lowest sea level periods of the Quaternary period. Let's move on to talk about the peopling of Australia. Only modern Homo sapiens spread to the farthest reaches of the world, way up into the far reaches of Siberia, into Australia, and into the New World, that is North, Central, and South America. Remember, this spread occurred during the Pleistocene, or the Ice Age, when glaciation periodically caused low sea levels, allowing some land masses to be joined, forming land bridges. This map shows the uh, hypothesized spread of modern Homo sapiens. And you see here them going down through the islands of Indonesia and into Australia and up across over Siberia into um, Alaska and down into North America. And the brown up there shows the land bridge that connected Siberia and Alaska. The Eastern Islands, Sulawesi, Lombok, Timor, the Moluccas, and the Philippines have never been linked by land bridges to either the Sunda Shelf or Australia or to each other. Note here on this map that what would have been land is colored light blue. These islands had limited mammal faunas, chance arrivals that managed to cross the water from Asia and Australasia. And although New Guinea, Australia, and Tasmania were joined into a single landmass called Sahul, the colonizers of Australia still had to cross water in boats to reach this landmass, and the longest stretch across ocean would have been 43 to 54 miles. In 1998, the Nali Tasi 2 project used middle Paleolithic stone tools to build this boat and sail it across the Timor Sea to Australia. It appears that Homo sapiens arrived in Australia during the last glacial maximum. They settled the north coast first and along rivers into the interior, but what were then coastal sites are now underwater. So we are lacking a lot of information about probably the earliest sites along the coast. Several major controversies exist. One of these is when was Australia first settled? Nowadays, 65,000 years ago is accepted. However, some people say that, they, that Australia was settled as much as 120,000 years ago, but that is a controversial statement. The earliest sites of 65,000 years ago are in the north. One of the most well studied of these is the rock shelter of Majedbibi. Note also Lake Mungo down in southeastern Australia, because I'll be talking about that in a moment. This lists some of the earliest sites in Australia, and you see the earliest dates are in the north and more recent dates to the south. A second controversy asks how did people spread throughout Australia? Several hypotheses have been proposed. One, concentric dispersal through the entire continent through one single entry point. Or coastal dispersal by using their boats to spread along the coastline and later enter inland areas, mainly via the major waterways. Or fluctuating colonization in and out of different environmental zones. For example, in plentiful years, they could occupy semi-arid regions but in drought years moved to areas with better resources. It likely was a combination of all of these. Among the oldest burials found so far in Australia are Mungo man dating to 42,000 years ago and Mungo woman dating to 26,000 years ago from the Willanda Lakes region in southeastern Australia. Now dry lake beds, when they lived there, this was a lake where people fished, collected shellfish, and hunted small game. A major drought began 40,000 years ago, that is 2,000 years after the death of Mungo Man. Archaeologists have recovered over 775 artifacts from this area. 
Mungo woman had been cremated, the remaining bones smashed, burned again, and then buried. Mungo man's body was covered with red ochre prior to burial. He was about 50 years old when he died. He'd had one tooth removed, a ritual still followed today when Aboriginal men enter adulthood. PBS has reconstructed what the burial would have looked like <clears throat> with his body painted in ochre. Mungo man's remains have since been repatriated to the Australian Aborigines. Now, among the skeletal remains, one skeleton from Mungo is very gracile, but modern Australians have heavy brow ridges and are robust. So this raises questions. Was Australia populated by two waves of immigration? Was the first wave gracile and died out? Or did the gracile immigrants, immigrants become more robust with time? To summarize the peopling of Australia, everyone agrees that Homo sapiens arrived by 65,000 years ago, but dates of 120,000 years ago for arrival remain controversial. By 30,000 years ago, all of Australia was occupied. People had to use boats, ocean-going boats, to reach Australia. The first settlements were along the northern coast and then other coasts and along rivers into the interior. We are uncertain how many waves of migration reached Australia. How many times did people launch boats from other islands and reach Australia? Looking at the islands in Indonesia and the Philippines that we've studied so far, they were populated during the Middle Pleistocene by Homo erectus, and some ocean water also needed to be crossed. At least on Flores, insular dwarfism occurred, creating a new species, Homo floresiensis. On Luzon, we also see a strange mixture of primitive and advanced physical features leading to the naming of a new species, Homo luzonensis. But on both islands, they were successful hunter-gatherers. And at least on Flores, they appear not to have survived past 50 to 60,000 years ago.